what I'm trying to do here is build a business that can do beautiful architecture. And it's just a completely different set of skills. Episode 152. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm speaking with Rod Moreno-Macy, founder and director of Moreno-Macy Architecture Studio. So Rod is a qualified architect and a member of the RIBA and the ARB, and he has worked on a wide range of projects specialising in residential developments, private homes, concept and boutique restaurants, office spaces, bars and hotels. Um, He graduated from the Bartlett in 1999 and cut his teeth in the West London high-end bespoke residential firm, Michaelis Boyd, who we've had on the show before as well, um, before setting out on his own in 2007. In this episode, Rod walks us through the firm's inception, their growing pains, the way that their team developed and his leadership grew, uh, the client acquisition strategies that they currently adopt, and their shift to a more systematic approach in designing journeys for their projects, for their clients and their teams. So sit back, relax and enjoy Rodrigo Moreno Macy. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Rod, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. It's very kind of you. My pleasure. I've I've been looking forward to speaking with you for a while. You've had a a really um, interesting career. Uh, I know that both of us share an overlap of having studied at the Bartlett and then you went off and you worked at Michaelis Boyd for for a number of years um and then set up moreno macy when, how long has it been going for now so we we set up um formally i suppose in 2010 so right. just o- just over the decade um hit the decade during uh, during the pandemic um so a bit low on low on the parties but um the uh, yes yeah, so i was at michaela Boyd for probably about the same time right um finished at the Bartlett in in 99 yep um and then I guess cut my teeth in West London, high-end bespoke residential at Michaelis Boyd um, before setting up on my own. It was um, on the back of working with a developer who I met through um, through my wife um, that uh, he had a project on Trafalgar Square that he wanted us to nice. convert these yeah, amazing first projects. And, you know, all, all thanks to him in terms of supporting me as a, as a young architect and mm. taking me on board and... and um, I suppose giving us the uh, the initial funding and the initial the initial kind of cash flow yeah. to set up the business. Um, so I've been doing little bits and pieces um, um, on the side. I think with Alex and Tim, there was an understanding that some of their you know friends and smaller projects would I would take on board. But then this became something much more formal, and on mm. the back of that, we set up the business. Were you um, were you kind of going for a phase of moonlighting for a period there when you were at Michaelis Boyd? It was. Time? There was, it was, it was, it was a tough time actually. And I think, yeah. you know, even, even Alex and Tim recognized towards the end that, that it's just not possible to kind of run a business in that way. And we're very understanding, very supportive of the fact that I actually needed to separate the two businesses out and, and, and have a kind of a, uh, a sensible, um, a sensible exit, which was good because, you know, we've got a great relationship with them from the past yeah. and clients from the time as well that I still know, but then also allowing me to build, build the business from there forwards. So, um, so, so setting up in 2007, you were shortly hit with one of the worst recessions that the economy's known in the last 50 years. How did you deal with that? Was that a kind of unexpected blow or? Well, I suppose in those, early, in those very early years, 2007, 2010, I was at Michaelis Boyd. So they, right, okay. they, they, bore, the, they bore the brunt of that, <laughs> <laughs> that recession. Wise. Um, I, was able, I was able to kind of do the odd very small project in the background. It wasn't, it wasn't really until 2010 when that project in Chicago Square came online. Right, okay. Um, that we actually formalized the business, you know, with an office and staff and furniture, um, <laughs> all that sort of stuff. Um, so really, I, I kind of, I always talk about 2010 as when we, when we set the business up formally. Got it, I got it, okay. And, and when you kind of went off and were 
running your own show, what were some of the biggest obstacles that you faced in those early days? Um, so I think, I mean, I think always one of the challenges is finding the right people. Yeah. Um, and when you're a small business setting up on your own as a, as an individual, it's balancing up finding the right people with not having enough money to, to pay the right people. So balancing up that kind of experience versus, versus cost. Yeah. But also, um, at the time, I think the business, well, there, there was no business plan at the time. You know, this was an opportunity that I took that I, I guess I'd always wanted to do. Um, I always wanted to have my own practice and run my own practice. Um, but there was no business plan as such. It was an opportunity that I, that I leapt on that we then built the business around. Mm. Um, and, uh, I suppose that the passage of time and, and having done this now for, for a long time, well, not a long time, but a longer time, let's say, um, that in fact, you know, some of the decisions that we made early on, I definitely would have done differently um, looking back now. Um, because I think the business was built around the idea of getting people to help me to be a good architect. Right. Um, and I think it's kind of that classic small business uh, thinking where you are the center of the business and yeah. everyone's helping everyone's helping me be a good architect. Mm. Uh, and that, you know, that kind of works for a while and that's fine. But of course, eventually you bottleneck behind yourself because everyone's looking for you and looking for your time and, and everything has to pass through you and in both directions, you know, from clients and from, and from the staff. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting because some of those early decisions, early challenges, um, I think may have been even more acute had I actually gone out and made a plan and hired the right people. <laughs> not, not that the people that I hired weren't fantastic. They absolutely were fantastic. Yeah. But I guess in a, in a business strategy point of view, I might have done it differently. So, so in those early days, you, you obviously had that initial project with the Trafalgar Square. Um, what were you doing in terms of building the pipeline and getting more projects in the door was there kind of a, a strategy there or was it kind of more reactive at the beginning and then it's kind of evolved into something more strategic now so i've been very fortunate i think that in probably the first six seven years of the business mm. we had a constant pipeline of people projects interesting projects good projects to work on mm. coming through the door um we had uh, one hospitality client we worked with who also kind of expanded us out to other hospitality clients. And they gave us a, a lot of work in, in rolling out um, restaurants. Um, and they were sort of a huge boost in terms of keeping cash flow going. Yeah. Um, but then at the same time, through word of mouth on the projects that we did, um, both with Trafalgar Square and other sort of residential projects we were doing at the time, we've, we had never had to advertise or market or, or, or really kind of use any of those skills that... that, that I now learned <laughs> yeah. with, the, with the benefit of hindsight um, are, are, are key to, to, um, to running the business. Yeah. Um, so actually, you know, it was, it was about sort of three, three, four years ago that I suddenly started to tighten up a little bit. We were kind of thinking, have we grown the business a bit too big in order to maintain this level of um, start, this staffing level? Um, are we doing certain things wrong? Are we, are we inefficient? Um, started to ask myself some of those questions and certainly kind of thinking, hang on a second, you know, the phone stopped ringing. Right. Now, now, what, now what do we do? Um, and it's an interesting moment because you kind of think, well, do I sit here and think, well, it's going to ring eventually? Yeah. Or do I, <laughs> you know, or do I get out of my chair and think, maybe it won't ring? <laughs> and, so so, what, and, and so what were yeah. some of the, the actions that you started to take to take at that point? Well, we, 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 um, I went, I went on, went out to sort of train myself in business, business leadership, working with a, working with a mentor to actually try to develop some of those skills and understand the business from the kind of the outside looking in. Um, I think he describes it as kind of flying above the clouds and looking down rather than, yeah. rather than kind of always being in the clouds and, and not really, really able to see the long, the long picture, the long game. So this is working um, with, with Johan. Yes. Working with, yeah. working with Johan, um, back in, I think probably started in, uh, 2018 maybe 2019 right. so you know that that sort of time when when i suddenly had uh i guess some real concerns that i was missing some of those basic skills mm. um 
And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say that I've affected them at all. But I think what, um, as we were talking earlier about not knowing, not knowing the things that you, that you don't know, is having that understanding um, in a business sense that there is a whole part of being an architect that I just didn't know anything about. Yeah. Um, and actually, potentially a more important part of it because, because you can always hire fantastic architects. Um, if you have the structures and the systems and the projects, to, you know, to keep them to keep them interested and, and develop them, yeah. you could always hire fantastic architects. I, I've never kind of I've never pretended, I suppose, to be um, the best architect coming out of the Bartlett or the best architect coming out of wherever. I've, you know, um, I've been a, I've always been a very good problem solver, mm-hmm. but I know that kind of architects with a capital A, there are better people out there. Um, but that doesn't phase me because that's not really what owning an architecture business is necessarily about yeah um you know i've kind of i sort of described it recently in kind of these early system systems conversations that i'm that i'm having that um um that i think the business should be about creating beautiful architecture in in the name of the company in our name rather than specifically by me yes and it's a it's a it's a you know it's a fine distinction i suppose in some ways semantics really um, but what it does is, is it, it frees up the team to be good architects in their own right, rather than always potentially mm. sitting behind the kind of the, the leader, if you like. It, it, um, it's, it's, it's quite a, an interesting evolution, if you like, from, from your role from when you first started out and then kind of, and also being aware enough that there's something else here in terms of business and being able to kind of take, get altitude, if you like, yes. to be able to, yeah. to, see, to see what's, what's happening. Um, what were some of the first specific things that you started to notice or started to implement in terms of, you know, taking on that C, CEO overview, if you like, of the company? Yeah. I, I mean, I think one of the, one of the first things that we, well, it was actually, it took a long time to do, but it's one of the first things that we looked to do is to actually restructure how the company was built. Right. Um, so we were organized in a fairly traditional sort of, you know, Uber Lord and then assistance <laughs> and then more assistance and then more assistance. Um, and so there was this kind of, you know, this pyramid of management, if you like, when we were at our peak, we were sort of 22, 23 members of staff, which is, I right. suppose, for a small business at year five, actually pretty big. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're 12 now as opposed to being, uh, which is a much more manageable size, but we're doing, broadly speaking, the same level of, you know, the same amount of turnover a year and that, with that same sort of team. Yeah. A little bit less, but then, of course, our overheads are much smaller. So, you know, in terms of profitability and what have you, it's not that different. Yes. Um, but the big difference is, I think, from a, from a client perspective, as much as anything else, is that our most talented people are as close to the projects as possible. Because in the kind of the hierarchical version where mm. Rod sits at the top, the work gets passed down and passed down and passed down because the senior team spend all their time making sure that the junior team get things right. Right. Whereas in fact, there's huge efficiency in making sure that the senior team do it right in the first place. Yes. Um, so you're sort of turning that, you're turning that kind of, that classic pyramid upside down rather than tr- rather than everyone trying to make me be a good architect i sit behind them saying right okay you guys be a good architect well, well, well like, i guess in that kind of traditional um pyramid structure it's vulnerable to you being the bottleneck exactly yeah exactly so by by spreading out that by spreading out that pyramid and actually saying saying to the team look you know there's no there's no one between you and the client you are between you know, you, yep. you are the front face of this company. Um, and, and in fact, the, the, the team that supports those leads is also, depending on their skills and their experience, is also very, very close to the projects. Mm. Um, so we, we no longer have these kind of structured teams, um, which in themselves create problems around information siloing and workload distribution. Yeah. Uh, we now have, a, you know, a, a, a series of trusted leads and then a series of trusted experts within the pool of, of, um, of architects that can move between projects, allowing us to create these kind of flexible teams, which can respond much better to the demands and resources that, that are required. You know, 
planning gets delayed, tender, tender needs value engineering, project gets pulled for six months because of funding. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't have this entire team structure sitting there thinking, what do we do next? Um, so, you know, that, that, that restructuring has allowed us to be quite nimble, you know, to grow expertise into a team, both specifically say, you know, say for example, you know, moving into, into uh, more 3D or moving into more BIM in-house, yeah. we can hire that in into, a t- into, a, into a pool of experts without having to build an entire team around that change in technology. Mm-hmm. It's, worked, it's worked well so far, I think. You know, maybe you need to ask the team. <laughs> what, what, what was, what, how did your role change then? What were the sorts of things that you were having to like, consciously let go of in terms of activities and things that you were doing and new skills that you were actively having to learn now? So, um, so I suppose I tried to re reposition myself as creative director right rather than rather than architect got it okay um and again this is all this is all semantic i suppose in some ways because you know i i i love what we do and i think we, we produce some beautiful things and I, I i would want to keep control of that kind of overall creative vision creative direction and i think also it's important for the team to, to understand that someone's someone's got that right someone's in charge of that yeah um, but it's very different to saying I, I'm creative director to saying I'm the architect, yeah. uh, particularly from a client's point of view. Um, what, that's one of the one of the things that I found absolutely the hardest to let go of is that kind of client interface, where you know you meet a client, you say, "Good to meet you." His, you know, have a conversation, sell the project essentially, and then say, "You know, welcome on board." Here's here's the guy you're working with. Um, as opposed to saying, welcome on board, where do we start? You know, that instant conversation, so that sort of stepping aside um, has been very, very hard. Very, very hard. Uh, because I, I think predominantly because we don't have, and this is going back to, to, to kind of next steps for us, is we don't have the systems in place mm. that will allow, you know, one of, our, one of our leads to deliver a project as though it was delivered by the company. Right. As opposed to delivered by the individual, me or them or whoever. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, 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 so it sounds like there's this, this is kind of migration, if you like, of trying to systematize all of your expertise and skills so that it's, you know, so that uh, another project lead can kind of take a project and run it through the sorts of Marino Macy way of doing things, if you like. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that um, I... I learned in the kind of working from home in the sort of 18 months working from home revolution, we'll use inverted air quotes for the revolution, um, is, is just how much repetition there is in my job when you take out the tube and the <laughs> sites and the lunch and the chat. Um, that suddenly when you are going from, from meeting to meeting to meeting to, uh, to, to, proposal, proposal, meeting, proposal, proposal, meeting. And you suddenly realize that, you know, the things that we do, 80, 20, you know, 80% of them are pretty similar every time. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that the projects can't be bespoke in themselves. It doesn't mean that the architecture has to suffer. You know, it doesn't, a, a, a lot of the time I have this conversation and people kind of get nervous saying, well, hang on a second, does that mean you're going to roll out the same solution each time? You're going to, cookie cutter these projects so that they all look the same and they all you know there's no challenge for the team anymore um but that's not the case Mm. the case is is that what you're trying to do is you're trying to you're trying to crystallize and capture all the things that over the past 10 20 i mean collectively across the team 70 80 years of experience crystallize that into into the stuff that we know Mm. that doesn't need reinventing yes Review, yes. Progress, yes. Reinventing, no. Let's just do it like that. And that actually frees up our time, frees up our kind of headspace and our, and our energy to make the other 20% absolutely brilliant. And that's where, you know, we can progress and we can throw ourselves into aesthetic challenges, into challenges around sustainability, into social challenges. Mm. Because, because we're not worrying about the shower leaking. You know, we're worrying about how we can make this building more efficient or more sustainable. Because 
you know, the waterproofing belt that was handled. So, so what were some of the specific things that you started to standardize that weren't in conflict with that kind of creative, innovative drive that's at the heart of the business? Well, I mean, we're very early in the process. This right. is, this is, this is um, um, a, a kind of, a, I suppose, an awakening over the last 18 months of this recognition. I mean, the, the, the team have always talked about systemization and standardization. And I think the thing is, is that things are pretty well standardized and systemized. Yeah. It's just not, it's just not, um, it's been organic, let's say. Yeah. The systemization has been organic. And so um, it lacks the rigor that would make it um, repl- replicatable mm-hmm. uh, because it's, it. you know, it's, it's up here, isn't it? Yes. And it sits, it sits in the heads of the, of the people doing the work. Um, it's not written down in some, in, in some, in some way. I mean, written down to me now is, I suppose, a little bit old school in terms of, I don't think anyone's going to start pulling out a 700 page manual to understand <laughs> how Miranda Macy do shadow gaps. You know, it's just, it's meaningless. Um, yeah. But I think uh, systemizing some of those processes. I met, I met a, a client who's an IT guy and he works in banking, um, doing the IT for banking. And um, they refer to them as journeys in their industry. Right. And I kind of, I like the idea of designing these journeys um, for, for a project, for a client, for, a, for, for the architectural team and how they develop through their careers and defining those as journeys. Um, mm. And... Um, designing those journeys to um, to respond quite specifically to the needs of the of the person on that journey right because what you know what a client needs out of a project is very different to what a to what an architect needs out of a project and often actually they're, they're very much at odds um, well, th- that's a very interesting point is that you know what what we're often trying to achieve as architects in the project is, is can be in conflict with what the what the client is wanting to achieve. So how, how, how do you make that distinction and kind of make sure that everyone's in, empowered around serving a, a kind of singular agenda, if you like? I mean, I think often, often those things are, are very much at odds, um, particularly if you, you know, when, when you start to bring different stakeholders into the team, interior designers have, have different, you know, different views to the architectural team, mm-hmm. as do project managers, as do the various engineers that you work with, structural and mechanical, they all have different agendas. Um, but I think what one of the biggest challenges with, with architects is that is that we um, we see ourselves as this kind of creative tour de force, but but because we're not artists, we're actually providing a you know commercial service. Yeah, we use the dirty word commercial, um, a land of dirty word service, right? Um, we we you know minimize our profession and saying actually we're the same as accountants or lawyers, let's say. Yeah, you know, because we're providing a service, and um, and often clients kind of coming to us with a set of problems that they want that they want addressing, with a set of challenges, with a set of oh, I think Johan would call them pains. Yeah. Um, so a set of a set of very individual problems that need solving. Um, and often as architects, we bulldoze in saying, "Oh, fantastic! You know, you're going to give me half a million pounds, and I'm going to go off and build my my dream." Uh, Kensington house for my portfolio and I'm going to show it to all my other clients and I'm going to be really you know proud of myself and architects let their ego get in the way they become um I think a little bit obsessed with with the idea of finding clients to fund their own egos yes um and we've tried very hard I've tried very hard in the business to kind of to kind of ask the question of the work that we're doing is is this really what the client's asking us to solve? Um, I've used an example recently with with a with a with a team with a client who constantly changed her mind, constantly, constantly changed her mind. Now, often you can't avoid that, right? People are people, and that's how they that's how they behave. But my view is that if a client is constantly changing their mind, you haven't solved their problem. Mm. You haven't shown them the thing that solves their problem. Because if you had, they wouldn't change their mind. So we either haven't asked the right questions early on to say, what, what problem are we fixing? Yeah. Um, or we haven't listened, tried to fix that problem if we did manage to hear it early on. No, you know, we no. run off on this little journey uh, to try and solve our own problems, to kind of deal with our own demons of, of our own kind of ambition. But it's, it's their house and it's their money and it's their time. And 
and we're, we're supposedly providing a professional service. So this is very, again, very kind of deep insight, if you like, into providing architectural services and the, the, the distinction and awareness of, you know, at school, for example, we are trained to kind of be thinking about our own ideas and finding a way to have our ideas manifest. And when we get into the world of business, we recognize, actually, if we're going to behave like that, that becomes problematic because we're kind of quite myopic in our focus. And we're trying to find, as you said, we're trying to find clients where we can live our dreams through as opposed to understanding what their, what their problems are. Um, and solving those architecturally. So in, in terms of your marketing and sales processes, um, and I know if you've been working with, with Johan, he's you know, a, great, a great sales trainer. Did you start to adapt the way that you were finding clients and beginning that kind of questioning process much earlier on to make sure that you were able to elicit those problems? But, I mean, very, very much so. I think um, learning, learning this, the... Um, Learning the art of listening in right. in say in those early sales conversations is absolutely critical. You know, it's it's um it's I suppose it's a little bit basic to say in some ways that you need to listen to your client, but listening to your client is fundamental. But actually, then listening to them and understanding them, and then also peeling back a little bit to understand the reasons for the things they're telling you, um, and really getting to the to the core of the problem you're trying to solve because. You know, particularly in these times with with challenges we have around sustainability and mm. around climate change, you know, the the your starting position, I suppose, in a project should be, why are you doing anything at all? You know, why why you know why don't you just paint that room white and move on, or put a picture up, or move your sofa? You know, those kind of easy fixes to the spatial challenges. Um, but unless you really listen to a client to ask what they're what they're trying to achieve, what the problems they're trying to solve you can react to the things they ask you for. You know, they come in, they come into your shop, as it were, to your studio and say, you know, we'd like to build a, a 2000 square foot basement and we want to do a rear extension and we want to knock the whole house down and keep the front up. And, you know, we want to put in six bathrooms, six bed, kind of classic projects that we end up um, working on in, in West London. Um, and, and often you sort of have to go, well, hang on a second, you know, what, what, what is it that you're actually trying to solve here? You know, do you need all this space? Do you need um, to uh, demolish the building? Do you need to build an entire basement? And do you know the basement's going to cost you, you know, one and a half million pounds and take you, you know, two and a half years to build? Well, hang on, what? You know, I met a builder yesterday. He told me it would cost me 300,000 pounds and we've done it six months, you know? So that's why I'm building it. I'm building it because someone's told me it's cheap and easy. Yeah, not because not because it solves a problem that I'm actually trying to solve. Yeah. Um, so, digging into those sorts of those sorts of real questions about how the family lives, how the how the how they use the space, you know, what's important to them is this their main home? Is it is it a you know a, a second home? Is it do they have extended large extended families who come to stay with them all the time? Do they you know, all of those questions? But then really listening to the answers mm. and not just writing them down and saying, great, fine. So we'll do our normal scheme anyway. <laughs> yeah, done that. <laughs> but you, listened. Yeah, we, we listened. Here's our normal scheme. And there's your pool table that you asked for, you know, tick. Because <laughs> again, that's very interesting as well, because it, it sounds so obvious, right? To listen to the client and, you know, we can use it as a piece of rhetoric in a business. Yes, we must listen to the client and you can always treat it as a checkbox exercise. Client, listen to, tick. Yes, we've done that. But what you're pointing to here is actually, is, is a bit deeper than that. Um, and really kind of understanding the, the sort of underlying emotional motives of where the client wants to go um, and kind of them being very actively involved in the, you know, the, the production of the design work, if you like. Well, I think I think one of the challenges we face as architects is because because um, you know architecture is a is a spatial visual medium, and everyone lives in houses and uses buildings and works in offices and you know uses our cities. Um, there's a kind of a general understanding of what architecture with a small a is. Yeah, um, and that can that can have the effect of making us as architects think that clients actually understand what we're saying or that 
what they tell us is actually what they mean. Mm. So there's this huge kind of clash in communication, I, I think made worse by the fact that we all live in cities and we all think we're talking the same language. Um, and so, you know, when, someone's, when someone comes to you and says, I want to, this, these are the changes I want to make to my house, it's easy to kind of go, well, you live in a house, you know, you know how you want to live. Maybe that's what you want. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you need to kind of peel back that that um, miscommunication, if you like, that 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 risk of miscommunication, and actually try to understand not 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 what the spatial solutions are, not what the not what the box looks like, mm-hmm. but what the problem you're trying to solve is at its core. I mean, you know, we we've told clients don't buy this house. You know, that's if you if you think about pounds per square foot best advice you give a client it would be don't buy this house do not spend you know your x million pounds on this building because it does not solve your problems and clients will thank us for that advice you know we don't get paid for that advice yeah but when they do buy a house they'll come back to us because that advice was so you know so fundamental in in um, in their decision making process um but we, we, you know, as architects, we're kind of keen, we're eager. Oh, you know, you're going to buy this house. I don't want to blow this sale. I don't want to lose this project because mm-hmm. you know, it's, a, it's a beautiful house. And, you know, they want to do this, all this work to it. Well, hang on, slow down. Because, you know, the worst thing we could do is spend all that time, spend all that money, and then have a client say to you, I hate this house. You know, <laughs> you know you, you've built me a house that I hate. You know, it may look fantastic. It may have won two awards. It may, you know, have the biggest sliding, moving, whatever in Europe. But, I hate it. I can't live in it. <laughs> this is this is quite again. This is quite an an insight as well to like to slow the process down. And as you as you say, particularly when we first start our own businesses, we're very enthusiastic. We're hungry. We kind of don't want to lose a sale, if you like. Um, we're eager to please. Um, but you know, there can be a learning when we take on the wrong sort of client, or we've been too quick to jump into a relationship. And in architecture sales cycles are slow relationships typically last 18 months as a minimum. Um, it's, it's not a kind of, you know, you can bash something out in a couple of weeks really, or even a couple of months and then be done with it. Um, high turnover, these tend to be kind of long lasting relationships that are, that are formed. How have you, or how do you now, how has your process of qualifying a client being a right fit for you? How has that changed and evolved over the last decade? I think it's. I mean, I think it's easy to look at look at clients with rose coloured spectacles and think that you know those those kind of alarm bells that you hear in in early meetings and early conversations won't evolve into real problems further down the line. <laughs> um, you know, because you know, because ultimately we are we are running a commercial business and we can't um, willfully turn away work that that may well be a fantastic project, a fantastic source of income. Um, but it's it, it's really about kind of investing the time up front before you I mean, before you put pen to paper before you pick a number you know for, for for fees or before you lay down programs or construction budgets to actually really um, try to connect with a client try to um, I mean try to try to offer them the opportunity to to, to evolve their brief. Even if, even in conversation, maybe in maybe in early pieces of work, but but mm-hmm. predominantly in conversation, so that um, they can see value in in having that conversation, um, because you know these are large sums of money that they're spending. You know, your, your classic kind of your classic project where you might involve an architect these days, I suppose, in my view, is somewhere around the quarter of a million pound mark. I think below that budget, a lot of clients may go to a builder and or you know or use a builder design build kind of enterprise so yep. quarter of a million pounds you know our projects typically typically are at the upper end of, of, of a million pounds up to sort of 10 15 million pounds yep. um, in size but at the you know those those upper end sales are different because you're dealing with commercial clients mm-hmm. but in that if we take that sort of million pound project that you tend to see in in, in west london 600 to 1.2 million pound sort of project and then we just kind of stop and pause and go it's a million pounds they're spending <laughs> one million pounds they're spending shouldn't we take the time to work out how to solve their problems yeah you know and should we be spending that on 
expensive tiles they didn't ask for or an expensive floor they didn't ask for or a you know a bunch of structural interventions that no one was no one was um uh they didn't solve the problems at the core of at the core of the project yeah um you know i i you know i think to myself they're spending a million pounds we've got to get this right and at the end of it they want to look back and go it doesn't matter what we spent i love this house this house is perfect and it's good for me for the next 10 15 20 years and every penny of that that i spent was worth it um you know because the flip side obviously is 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 that regret and you know even worse than that is that regret mid project mm. where you know we, we were involved in a project recently where we were brought on board midway through this is one of those kind of alarm bell projects that are really probably should have walked away from, but at the time we didn't. Um, that he'd spent an enormous amount of money you know, in, in the several million pounds to, to dig a basement and redevelop his house. And midway through, it just stopped, kicked everyone off site and said, I don't like it. Everybody get off site. I'm going to live here in its kind of plasterboarded state for a few months and try and get to grips with the house so that I can understand what the project should be. Right. And uh, in we walk and we say, okay, we'll solve your problems for you, obviously, and have these long conversations about, about what problems we're solving. The problem wasn't the house, right? The problem was that he was living in the wrong, he was living in the wrong city. He was doing the wrong job. He was, this, this house didn't answer the challenges that he had. Yeah. Um, and of course, we didn't realize that until a long way through the project where he, lo and behold, stopped the project again. <laughs> he kicked everyone off and said, this project isn't working, you know, I need to change teams. Well, hang on a second, you know, um, this house isn't solving your problems. Yeah. You know, we should have walked in day one and said, you know what, sell this house. <laughs> buy yourself, buy yourself your, your farm in the country that you've been talking about for our entire, <laughs> for our entire meeting <laughs> and sell this house. It, that, again, that's a very sort of, um, being able to know that now is a very valuable it's a very valuable lesson and it can save us, you know, a, a tremendous amount of pain um, working with the wrong clients or sometimes clients are trying, you know, they've come to the architect thinking that this is the house that I want. This is what I want to do. They're br- giving us a brief, but actually yeah. deep down, this is not, we, you know, this is not the right problem that they're solving. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We, we, we see that time and time again and we've been, we've been caught up in it too. Yeah. And I guess, what what that tends to what that tends to deal uh, lead to is that if you end up in a if you end up not solving the problem, you know you have clients who change their mind consist, consistently changing their mind, or you'll have clients who delay decisions, and you have clients who um, you know will stop and start and what have you. Um, and these are all kind of you know we we want to blame the client for being mm-hmm. a difficult person, but it's 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 really our you know. It's, it's really our fault, if you like, for not understanding the problem correctly. Yeah. Um, and what that does is it then creates tension in the project. And, and all that could possibly lead to is, you know, falling out with your architect, falling out with your client, falling out with your builder, delay, cost, and all of those things that, you know, we work so hard to avoid. Um, all, all kind of stemming from the idea that we didn't really address the challenges mm. of that, that that particular client was trying to solve um yeah sometimes it's sometimes that sorry go on. i was going to ask it could you walk us through the the sort of sales process that you go through with your clients to ensure that you're getting to the root of the problem and how, how you're establishing this type of relationship that you're talking about it's it's really really simple and I, you know it sounds kind of i suppose quite kind of idiosyncratic but it's really really simple it, it, uh-huh. it's just really kind of asking uh initially fairly gentle questions Yep. You know, you, you go through that process of saying, tell me, tell me the story behind this house. You know, when did you buy it and what have you done to it? Because you must make sure that you know what they've done to it before you start <laughs> telling them it's terrible. <laughs> um, tell me what you've done to it. Why have you done it? You know, how many children have you got? What ages are they? You know, when do you want to do this project? Because if their children are five and this project is a three-year project, mm-hmm. let's design for a 10-year-old. Let's not design for a five-year-old. You know, those sorts of questions. So they're quite gentle, I suppose, at first. And then you start to kind of recognize patterns in the things that they're saying. Yeah. So they do all, they do all the talking, all the talking. I'm noting, noting away at this point. You start to recognize patterns of the things that they're saying. And at that point, you start to, I suppose, poke a little bit at those things. Right. Say, okay, so, you know, so, so why wouldn't you move the kitchen? And they go, no, 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 we can't move the kitchen. You know, we spent 50,000 pounds in that kitchen and it took us a year to design 
okay, fine. Kitchen's <laughs> off the table. <laughs> um, and, you know, you have these little pointed kind of conversations to kind of find um, places where where there's real kind of emotional I'll let, I'll let involvement in the process. Yeah. So they, and they'll, they'll reveal those things to you. Um, whether it's as you walk around the house, whether it's, um, you know, on a, on a meeting in a coffee shop, when you talk about the project. Um, and, and what's surprising, oddly enough, is that although most projects, I think 99% of projects are driven commercially by time and money, those are rarely the problems that need fixing. Right. It's rarely about doing something for the least amount of money possible. It's often about finding an intelligent way to solve a problem that fits the budget. And I, I'm kind of, I'm nervous that I don't want to sound in this, in this conversation as though these things don't have to be beautiful. Yeah. Because I think what we have as a gift in, 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 in architecture and, and as architects is to be able to solve these problems elegantly and beautifully. These solutions don't have to be mundane. They don't have to be ordinary. They don't have to be unimaginative, mm. but they have to solve the problem. Yeah. Otherwise they are just art. They are just patronage. They are just ego, mm. ego projects, my portfolio. So beautiful. Yes. Architectural. Yes. Rigorous and intelligent and elegant but they have to solve the problem. Yeah. I think that's important. Brilliant. Um, how, we were discussing earlier, actually, one of the challenges that many architects face when growing a business such as, as yours is the, is the hiring process and building, the, and building and making sure that you've got the right team. How has that process changed for you over the last 10 years? Because you were saying, obviously, at the beginning, you know, you, you, were, you were fortunate and able to, to bring on great people um but to sustain to, to sustain employees if you like having them be part of the team for long periods of time and to find new employees can often be quite challenging how have you evolved that process in your business um i mean firstly we you know we systemized it that's yep. one of the things we've, we've done we've systemized it we've tried to find efficiencies in it and actually video conferencing has provided us with massive efficiency there you know we're able to to connect with them um, many more candidates more quickly and understand candidates more quickly um but i think um the key the key to to um getting good staff is understanding what the team actually want from the practice so there's that kind of reverse interview because we all think that we're interviewing the member of staff to find out if they are the right person for the team if they have the right skills if they have the right attitude and what have you mm. um but as business owners i think you forget that you're also on on interview you know they're also trying to find out what they can gain from your business from being part of that team from being yeah. part of those projects um so um in part of this systemization uh, process that we're going through at the moment early days as i say one of those journeys that we want to build for um for our team um, is about how we develop, how we develop them, um, how we train them, turning turning the practice um, into a more, in, into a more overtly training based um, business, right? Um, which is which is I, I suppose you know architecture has always had that kind of sense of apprenticeship, um, but. Um, my experience of it is that it's the, the, the process is basically watch the master and hopefully enough bits of information will fall out of his head that you'll become amazing. Um, and I, I think we can do better. You know, I think we can do better than that by putting in um, very simple things like understanding, understanding, you know, the skills that they have currently and allowing them to, to train and to expand their skills and give, I mean, giving them the right experience. Um, and so, Making that, making that um, obvious in the hiring process, I think is important to, 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 um, to a lot of people, you know, joining a team that they will be able to grow and develop in a company. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's what we're all looking for is to grow and develop, but whatever, whatever level we're at, wherever our skills are, whatever our attitude um, or aptitude for risk or for entrepreneurship or for architecture, we're all looking to develop ourselves and to grow in these professional services. So, making that apparent 
within the hiring process, I think is, I think is important. Um, and turning and, and create, one thing we have struggled with is, is by creating this flat structure that we've, that we've sort of tried to um, implement to put the architects as close to the um, projects as possible. Yeah. Is that um, a lot of people come to the team and say, you know, which project will I be working on? Um, and the answer is, well, you are working on lots of projects, you know, mm -hmm. at different levels, at different scales. Um, we're not, we're not project specific in the project that you're working on. We're skills specific. So if you're fantastic at, at conservation, if you're fantastic at um, detailing, if you're fantastic at master planning, if you're fantastic at layouts, we'll put you there. We'll get you doing that across lots of different projects. And then as you're exposed to the to the rest of that project, we'll train you in the elements that you're not so good at. You may not be so good at the detailing. So do the planning part of it and we'll train you through the detailing. But it's at odds with, I think, what a lot of um, new members of the team come to that say they want to learn how to be an architect from A to Z. Yeah. So they want to kind of turn up at this magical moment where the client's just phoned and you say, a client's just phoned, You've just joined the practice. Here's the phone, it's yours. And, uh, you know, we'll sort of support and guide you all the way through to the end. Ask us questions um, when you need. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and, and, you know, we were built that way too. That's exactly how we were built as a small company growing up. But trying to reverse engineer that process and say, well, actually, isn't it better that we truncate the projects across the way rather than vertically? Mm -hmm. And you know, make experts in a variety of different parts of their professional curriculum, if you like. Yeah. Um, by doing things over and over again, by systemizing, by de-siloing across the different projects. Um, but it's quite a hard message to get across when, it, you're, it, when you're trying to change the, hier the hierarchy of small practice to, I think, probably how larger practices work. Yeah. I don't know. I've never worked in one and taking it to a small practice. And it, it was, it's interesting as well, what you're describing is there's that expectation as well, um, particularly with architects or young, young architects or architectural assistants when they've come out of university, there is a kind of a, a certain set of expectations that you have, which aren't necessarily what practice is like. And this kind of linear A to, a to Z process of becoming an architect isn't how it works and that often when you step into practice you know you're not going to work on a project necessarily from start to finish you might end up coming in when it's on site you do a bit of work there then you're put onto another project where you're in competition phase and then you're working on another project in planning phase and it can be a little bit bitty if you like yeah and i think that's i think that's potentially what people expect if they go to a larger commercial practice right i think you know that kind of the old um anecdote of just working on door schedules for two years or what have you um which I, i'm sure is not actually specifically true but I, again i wouldn't know i'd never worked in a large practice um and the people come to small practices because they want to get a wider set of experience um but i think the challenge that we have is selling the idea that wider experience comes across lots of different projects right because we can't all sit around waiting for planning to come in while you know because you're on one project we yeah. can't all sit here and, and, and wait eight weeks for the for the planning to come in or we're still to be refused to start again right so um actually cutting those projects allows well i mean in my view it allows you to see the whole spectrum of a project in a much shorter period of time um, which I think, you know, I, th I think is, is, is better training, but it's a message we need to get right. I mean, we, uh, one of the challenges that, that you have in, in, in hiring is that, is that um, and, you know, uh, the UCL is, is, is kind of, I suppose, paramount in, in, in this as one of the better universities in, in, in the world, I think, um, in that it, it trains architects with a capital A. I use this analogy from... Um, from medicine that um, architects are trained to be brain surgeons and they're tr you know they're, they're, they're trained to look at this handful of superstar architects across the world across history um, so their training is about being this brain surgeon and then they turn up in practice and they say right where's my brain i want to get straight to work on a brain and actually you know most of architecture the analogy would be that we're you know country you know country village gp um, 
learning that kind of experience of seeing um, seeing problems on the ground, building through solving these kind sort of simpler problems to then working on larger and larger scale projects. I mean, you know, the, the reality is, of course, that there aren't that many brains to operate on yes. in the architecture. You know, you, you flick through the AJ and, you know, the AJ doesn't show you reams and reams of very beautiful, very well considered, very well developed problem solving projects that were done all across London that day. Yeah. But it does show you that one tower in Dubai or that one tower in London and that one bridge in, in Spain. And we all think that that's what architects do and that's what architecture is and that's what it should be. Mm. Um, so the media education and our own kind of personal creative egos, I suppose, don't prepare us very well for serving our clients in a, in a professional sense. And then, of course, if we don't do it professionally, we can't be commercial. Yeah. Yeah. That's very interesting. That's the, the kind of culture of design, if you like, or the reverence that we have towards design and the, yes. the, the kind of misguided belief that we have about it and what's actually available. And it obscures us, as you said, it obscures us actually to the, to the beauty in being able to solve a client's problem elegantly. And that, yeah. actually, that's, that's, there's a lot of joy and reward in that. And there's lots of problems out there to solve that don't involve tower blocks and and bridges and airports um you know there's, there's a lot of problems out there. a lot of people who want these problems solving and also want them solving beautifully you know you don't go to an architect if you don't have some sense of the fact mm. that they can add value to the process and that value typically comes in understanding how it's done and making sure it's beautiful yeah um you know it, it's 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 finding that balance between between our own egos and our clients needs that i think i think often we get wrong on this kind of aspect of the you know design design culture and the, the problem solving beauty of architects if you like how would you propose if you like that perhaps education would evolve to kind of be better merged because you i know you you've got experience working as you know obviously you're, you're, you're a practice leader and also uh, a role um, having been a tutor or being a tutor at diploma level, how would you yeah. how would you like to see the two worlds start to merge? So, um, slightly sideways answer to this one is is I think that that um, I, I read a lot of kind of side side books, if you like, that aren't specifically architectural. In fact, um, I read more about economics and socioeconomics and popular science, I think, than architecture. And I think um, uh, there's a couple of really interesting uh, mathematical analogies about the absence of data. Mm. Um, that it's, uh, it's very easy to focus on the data that's presented, but you ignore the absence of data as though it didn't happen. So circling back to your question, yeah. um, I think one of the challenges in architecture is that we're being trained to design this tiny sliver of buildings and not being trained to design the 99% of the buildings that are actually being produced, the actual services that are required, um, whether that be at skills level or at an understanding of how people live and how people function in cities, um, or, you know, or even at skills level, as I say, in terms of the technicality of solving these problems. You know, it's critical that architects are taught to be problem solvers and they're taught the principles of design um, and aesthetics and um, the sort of the, the bigger picture of what we have to do as architects. But I mean, going back to the 80-20 point, it's probably 20% of, um, of the things that we do. And maybe architecture should focus the training on the 80%. Yeah. There's just much more technical. And, and you know, imagine, imagine if, uh, if, if we were visionary, as an industry, if we were visionary, and technical um, rather than I think you see you see practices that choose to be one or the other um, you know we do we do a lot of work where we're given projects at, at um, planning <laughs> and then a contractor will appoint us as the architects to kind of make it work <laughs> I mean, so that, that to me as an architect seems ludicrous that you would design something put it into planning and then give it to another architect to make it work yeah. Why, why doesn't it already work? 
um, and it's because and it's because you know there's there's that sort of skills gap in the industry that says that it doesn't really matter how it works because you know it changes some polemic or changes some skyline or some aesthetic and that maybe has more value mm. um, but it ignores i think it ignores the what society needs from architects again and this is really interesting that there's in in our education is there's perhaps um like a core competencies that is starting to be missed um and particularly construction information and construction detailing and and knowing what's i mean i know when i left the bartlett my some of the embarrassments that i had working in practice of my complete not knowing about any form of construction and not being able to identify things on site was was quite comical i know i'm not alone in that um you're not you're, you're not alone i mean i i i am the same way i had the same set of embarrassments over details and materials and you know people pointing things out to me i i, I suppose um it, it's good that we're able to recognize that in ourselves i suppose um but if you were anything like me i guess um you probably tried to make sure that no one knew that you didn't know what you were talking about <laughs> yeah you, you, you think, kind of you're like oh right yeah. okay, hold on a minute yeah yeah and, and um you know um that's very dangerous mm. that's very dangerous I, I find that's very dangerous you know to, to have um to have architects with these core competencies missing because they haven't learned them at university fine but maybe they're still missing because they never learned them through a proper training program in in in, in practice yeah and then finding themselves in a situation where a client says we'd like to do this and, and the architect thinks well i've solved problems like this before so i'm just going to have a go yeah and you know take it back to the medical analogy is you wouldn't want you wouldn't want your brain surgeon to say hang on a second i'm just going to google this because i've never done it before and i need to just google a couple of websites and just check the data on it and then and then we'll do the surgery you know and how often have you found yourself in a you know in a design situation where you think i don't know how to do this i better do some research yeah um rather than actually saying i don't know how to do this mm. you know we as a professional i'm advising you that this sits outside the realm of what i do yeah let's let's put a plan into place to deal with that um but we don't because you know we're sort of protective of the fact that we are these uh, master builders these kind of you know master of the of the industry and we're you know we're scared to tell builders that we don't know what we're talking about mm. you know i relish i relish the uh, conversation with builders where i actually find out how they do things you know how they actually do things yeah working working on these problem solving projects that i mentioned where contractors come to us for these kind of making it work if you like working for a contractor has been incredibly uh, eye-opening in uh, understanding the difference between a good detail and a buildable detail and um and ultimately you know if a good detail can't be built then either it will get built differently and you'll never know about it or it will get built badly yeah um, and both of those things are dangerous so if we if we can if we can kind of cut the ego and talk to our to our professional collaborators in engineers in um in construction and actually listen to, to their challenges. Mm-hmm. Same conversation, right? We're listening and listening and understanding their challenges. Um, all of a sudden, we can produce better information more efficiently um, and kind of speed up that kind of speed up the wheels of the entire construction process because I can try to get to detail. It's in a format that he loves. He knows how to build it. It's so organized in the way that can be packaged up um, and, um, and it's cost effective. Yeah. So he can price out the risk, the client benefits, we, everyone benefits the process. And of course, what I'm saying to you here is not new information to large practices. This is how large practices do it. Yeah. It's just not how small practices do it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, I, I love where this conversation has has gone. There's been some really great insights here from your from your experience. Um, what's next? What's next for the rest of... Uh, for this year and leading on to 2022 for, for your own business? I think we're, we're keen to, um, to build our pipeline. Um, that's, uh, you know, COVID and the, and, the, and the pandemic has impacted on, on the industry mm-hmm. for sure. But we're definitely seeing that kind of changing now. And it's making sure that we have a system in place to 
to take on board the work that's coming. So it's not, not so much the inquiries aren't there because I think they are there, but it's making sure that we have the systems in place to receive them. And that those systems are better than the ones we had before, you know, reflection time is a, is a, is a, is a, is a great thing to allow reflection on, on how we do business, how yeah. we do architecture. Um, and also systemization, as I say, very early days in the process of systemization. And I think that for me is the next sort of two to three years of, of, of the business is um, turning it into a, turning it into a business that can produce great architecture without me. It's kind of, it's, it's almost perverse to say it as an architect because, you know, I was supposed to love architecture for buildings and of course I do. Yeah. But if I wanted to do architecture, I could just go and join a big practice. Yeah. What I'm trying to do here is build a business that can do beautiful architecture and it's just a completely different set of skills. Brilliant. Love that. Love it. Excellent. I think it's a perfect place for us to conclude the conversation, Rod. Thank you so much for uh, your time this afternoon and, and sharing no, thank you. your expertise. And it's re really wonderful hearing, yeah, the, the kind of the deep insights that you've had. So thank you so much. Yeah, it's been quite the journey. Um, but yeah, it's been fun. <laughs> Brilliant. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.